All right, so we go on yet a deeper level of uh, solid state uh, studies, and now we finally include the actual crystal lattice in our consideration, but still at a toy model level this week. So we're going to look at a bunch of one-dimensional models where atoms are coupled by springs or electrons hop from one side to the other. Um, surprisingly, these simple, very simple models will allow us to introduce a huge number of concepts from solid state physics that set your thinking frame for the real solid state physics for when we don't make any such simplified approximations. Um, so the models from the 1D uh, have a lot of concepts that will be useful later on. So this is already enhancing um, the understanding of how things work for real in solids greatly just to consider these simple models. Um, they also do a better job at predicting various things like heat capacities and so on. So we are constantly improving that. But it is even beyond the point at this stage because the deeper level of understanding is of much higher value than being able to um, predict heat, heat capacity better than divided, for example. OK. So here is a crystal lattice. But what we're going to have today is just this. Um, this is a lattice of atoms um, bound by interatomic forces, approximated as balls uh, on springs into a chain, combined into a chain. Uh, now, um, in this first model, it's called a monoatomic chain, means all of these balls have the same mass. Uh, monoatomic as opposed to diatomic, for example, which we'll get to hopefully later today or on Thursday. Um, and then these springs, these are classical springs of spring constant kappa. Uh, they approximate interatomic forces that hold these atoms together in a crystal lattice. So we're not going to discuss interatomic forces during the lecture. You probably had some of that in your chemistry or maybe even in your physics. So I encourage you to read the chapter on this. Uh, I think it's chapter 8 of the textbook, which gives a pretty good introduction. And I put one problem, I think it's one problem on the homework to, for you to um, you know, think about interatomic forces, uh, think about um, uh, how solids expand uh, as you change temperature. Um, but uh, for now, we just model them by a classical spring. In fact, in fact, our first model will be entirely classical. So that's also uh, uh, very interesting that even from uh, considering this chain completely classically, we can already uh, introduce some of the valuable uh, concepts. OK. So um, when this spring is at equilibrium, that means that uh, the springs that we model are unstretched. They're not stretched. They're not compressed. They're just that they're happy in their happy positions. Um, and then uh, the distance between uh, these atoms is A. Okay. And you can, uh, you know, all the information about this chain is contained uh, just in here. Right? If we know the mass m, the spring kappa, and the distance a, then we can construct the rest of the chain from these parameters. And that is already um, a fundamental importance for all crystals because when we want to talk about a crystal, right, we don't want to list all the atoms in a crystal because that will take forever. So we uh, define just one unit of a crystal. It's called unit cell. Uh, and then we uh, understand that we can reproduce the entire crystal by repeating this unit cell n times. In this case, n times in one dimension, but in general, n times in three dimensions. So in this case, a unit cell includes a single atom, and uh, the size of the unit cell is A. 
And then if I tell you this, then uh, if I tell you this about another crystal, you will be able to reproduce crystal by knowing the unit cell. So this by translation of the unit cell uh, in one dimension. So then um, for an nth atom, we immediately know the position of that atom because he's, he's in the n, in nth cell and then its equilibrium position. So when all the sp springs are not compressed, not stretched, uh, relaxed uh, is n times a. Okay. So the phenomenon we're going to be looking uh, at with these springs is, of course, vibrations of this chain. And uh, therefore, uh, we need to introduce these uh, deviations from equilibrium displacements, uh, which are delta x for each atom in a chain. For the nth atom, that's the difference between the actual position of an atom, an instantaneous position, and the equilibrium position. So um, then we can just forget about the equilibrium positions, uh, forget about these positions, and think just about displacements of atom from the equilibrium positions. Um, and what we're going to be looking for uh, will be normal modes of this system. So classical physics, normal modes. Normal mode means that all atoms vibrate at the same frequency. Yeah. And in general, when you have n atoms, you can have many different modes. Yeah. You can have one mode where they all move together. Right? That will be one mode. Uh, just the entire crystal moves together. Or you can have modes where waves propagate through uh, the lattice. Uh, one limitation of uh, us being in one dimension is, if you remember our first discussion of phonons, uh, I said that we can have transverse and longitudinal modes. Well, in one dimension, you can only have a longitudinal mode described by these displacements in the X, so along the same direction as the propagation of the wave. Okay? So transverse modes are not possible in one dimension. OK, so uh, if uh, an nth atom is displaced from its equilibrium position, then it will experience a force due to the other atoms. But those atoms might also be displaced. Right? So uh, therefore, the force uh, will be given by the difference of displacement. So this first term will be the force acting on the nth atom from n plus first atom. This force will be the force acting on the nth atom from the direction of the n minus first atom. So two adjacent atoms ex ex um, apply uh, forces uh, on the first atom. So we expand these uh, brackets. And this will be our equation of motion for the nth atom under the influence of this force. So uh, you can imagine that for each site we have such an equation and therefore we have a system of differential equations uh, which uh, are all uh, coupled. So the variables are the displacements of the atoms and the equations are just the equations of motion, just in Newton's second law. So um, it is a system of equations. Uh, how do we solve it? Well, we solve it by um, coming up with a pretty good guess for what the solution will be. Yeah. And you may have seen this already from before, what that guess might look like. Um, what we're going to find is that uh, these vibrations propagate as waves. There might be standing waves. Uh, and therefore, we're going to look for solutions in this waveform. So this is called an ansatz. Um, so it's a function that we will plug in to the equation. We will see that this set of functions satisfies these equations. And we will find these different parameters here. So it is uh, a solution for a wave similar to those of photons, for example. 
So it has k, the wave vector in here, and omega, the frequency. And if we plug in, instead of x equilibrium uh, n times a, then this will be uh, how the wave's going to look. And uh, this is a complex number. Uh, we are talking uh, just real displacements here. And therefore, we're just going to throw away the imaginary part at some point. And uh, this is a standard trick. Uh, so we introduce a complex number, but we only care about the real part of that. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's just from the math department. Um, this means that uh, we can limit ourselves to positive omega. We don't need to worry about negative omega. Uh, however, k can be positive and negative, and that would correspond to waves moving forward and waves moving backward. Okay. So that's positive and negative. k ha do have a phys real physical meaning, as opposed to negative omega. Okay, uh, so this slide shows you what happens when we plug in the ansatz of a plane wave into the equations of motion. So again, we're just going to show it for the nth displacement. Um, we plug in this ansatz into this equation. Um, we're going to have a lot of the similar looking terms. In particular, we can take out of the brackets uh, this exponential term, which is common for uh, all of these terms. And we have the same one here. Therefore, these already cancel. That's quite convenient. Um, and what is left looks uh, very much like a cosine on the right side. And on the left side is just uh, omega squared. Now, uh, this cosine uh, is cosine uh, minus a constant, minus 1. And so that can be transformed into a sine squared of half of the argument. So this is this divided by 2 here. And we, instead, we write sine squared. So. We have omega squared equal to a constant times a sine squared by the end of the day. This math is not very complicated, so I'm going very quickly through it. Uh, but as we take a square root of this equation, we find that omegas and k's are related by this sinusoidal dependence. So uh, for... Um, this function to be a solution of this equation of motion. Uh, we need to plug in uh, omega that corresponds to this in terms of k. Okay? That's the math. What is the meaning of this? Now, first of all, whenever we have a relationship between omega, the frequency, and k, the wave vector or the momentum, right, the, the wave vector's meaning is often... Uh, the momentum, or it's a concept derived from momentum. Uh, we call this a dispersion relation. Um, so frequency is related to energy, and uh, k is related to momentum. So it uh, is a relation between energy and momentum. Uh, that's also sometimes called a dispersion relation. So the simplest one uh, is, of course, a parabola. Right, um, So P and E are related by a parabola for a free particle in free space. That's just the kinetic energy of a free particle. Uh, here we have a different function. Right? So these vibrations uh, obey a different dispersion relation, this kind of sinusoidal dispersion relation. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, analyzing this relationship. Here is a plot of it. It is just a, a sine function, but because we took a square root, uh, it is taken by the absolute value. So it's a sine function that's flipped uh, to the positive direction. It has a zero 
at 0. And uh, it is obviously a periodic function. So if I plot it um, in these units of Ka divided by pi, which will be an important unit during this lecture, uh, Ka divided by pi, uh, then uh, function's period will be from minus 1 to 1. The period in these units will be 2. Okay. So this is just scaling out the argument of this sine function. Now the amplitude of this function is 2 times kappa divided by m, so obviously it has something to do with uh, this uh, vibrations of the spring, so it, it can be tracked down back to the uh, fr frequency of vibration of a single mass on a spring. And so this formula has something from each part of the model. It has the distance between uh, atoms, A, and it has kappa and it has M. So it has everything that we gave in, put in to the, uh, to the model. Okay, now first of all let's look at this function um, close to 0k. Down at small k, small k means slow, small momentum, um, or small k times a. Um, the function here looks linear, right? Uh, at small argument, at small k times a, we can expand uh, the sign to be roughly linear, right? So the first order sign becomes a linear function uh, at small k. Um, and then we can think about these waves really as being sound waves. Uh, that's because for a sound wave, uh, the dispersion relation is indeed linear. So omega for a sound wave is proportional to k, and the co proportionality coefficient is then the sound velocity. So there is a very good analogy to sound for these normal modes of a one-dimensional chain, but we have to look down here where it is linear. So there we're dealing with sound, and we can actually calculate what the sound velocity is. The sound velocity is just a prefactor that one connects omega and k, and so it is just a divided by kappa divided by m square root. So this is the sound velocity that we can derive from this formula by replacing sine of Ka divided by 2 with Ka divided by 2 at small k times a. Okay, uh, and obviously uh, this uh, relationship breaks down when we can no longer expand the sine function like that. And so far away from zero, here towards the end of the picture, towards the boundary, the sine function bends. Uh, actually here, group velocity becomes zero for these modes. Um, and uh, around here, the relationship fails spectacularly, right? Because we used to, you know, we cannot... Um, keep going linear, we bend down and there is a maximum omega naturally in this model. There is a frequency which cannot be physically exceeded in this vibrating chain. There is a maximum frequency, right? So that's an important concept. Uh, and we will see in a moment where that maximum frequency comes from uh, intuitively, but mathematically we have derived this dispersion relation between k and omega, and it's a sine function that has a maximum frequency. And so here, group velocity turns to zero, so waves, uh, the, the, the wave packet no longer moves, essentially. Uh, and we cannot exceed this frequency. There will not be a solution for this system of equations for higher frequency. So that is a departure from the simple sound wave uh, approximation that we can make at small k. Okay, so this is a visualization of normal modes of a one-dimensional chain. Uh, it's just from Wikipedia. Uh, you can uh, go there and uh, 
look at this picture if you can get enough of it. Uh, I, I have to always break eye contact with the screen when I look at it because it's, it's really mesmerizing. Uh, but uh, OK, it's an important picture. Um, as you go up in this picture, uh, you have a higher and higher k. Okay? So remember, we were going from low k, where we have the sound wave picture, to high k, where somehow that sound wave picture breaks down and there is a maximum frequency. So uh, if this is our dispersion relation, then we start here and we move to here as we go up in this picture. And so this is how a sound wave looks. This is something that looks very much like a sound wave. k is equal to pi divided by 6a. And the frequency is uh, half of the maximum frequency or half of some proportionality here. Um, what it looks like is all the atoms move with the same frequency. The, the period of their vibration is always the same. Uh, however, you can just see that uh, the wave really propagates through the chain. And so that is what a sound wave does. And then you start seeing some deviations from that. And especially out here, at the maximum possible k at the boundary of the zone, it's right here. It's right here. Uh, what you see is that atoms move out of sync, out of phase. Uh, adjacent atoms just move out of phase with each other. And that is the maximum possible uh, frequency that you can reach. So each atom moving in the opposite direction. That's the shortest wave and the largest, uh, largest omega that we can have in this system. So anything above that hits this fundamental uh, ba barrier set by the fact that we have atoms on sites and those atoms uh, must move. Uh, they cannot move. Uh, they cannot make any shorter waves than this. Okay, so this is this is a sound wave, and this is this uh, limit of the uh, one-dimensional chain model. And in between, you have you know, something that's more like a sound wave and starts to look more and more like this. Okay. Keep looking at this formula. Uh, another thing that we uh, can, of course, very easily realize is that, OK, if all the math in this formula has some meaning, then what about extending this function? I keep going. Uh, and then, of course, this function can allow for solutions in terms of k, not in terms of omega, but in terms of k that keep going to infinity. Omega is limited by omega max, set by twice this frequency. Uh, but k can be uh, extended infinitely, and then the function will just repeat itself. So what I showed you in the beginning is just this interval from minus 1 to 1, which is a very important one, and it contains the entire function. But then uh, there are these uh, extensions. Uh, so whenever we... Uh, cross one of the red lines, we will see in a moment that that's called going from one brillion zone to another. Okay? So these uh, areas between the red lines are called brillion zones. Brillion. I spent the whole summer in France, but uh, okay. can't, still can't say this name. Um, OK. So let's explore this uh, idea that k can be anything. k can be any number, right? Um, what does it mean from the point of view of a one-dimensional chain, right? So we started with uh, atoms on a chain, and now we have this function which describes all the solutions, so uh, infinite number of k. Uh, well, uh, it is not such a big deal, turns out, that you can have all these k's 
because a lot of these cases describe exactly the same wave. Okay? That's the short story. Uh, we're going to go into some detail here, but the short story is uh, higher case that extend beyond pi a, uh, uh, um, pi a over uh, a over, yeah, just get beyond the first zone, um, pi, a, uh, pi two pi over a, sorry, um, just describe the same solutions. So uh, we have a pretty good way to deal with that. Uh, the way to see it is that. Uh, if you plug in, instead of k, if you plug in k plus pi, 2 pi over a, sorry, doing it again, if you plug k plus 2 pi over a, then you will get exactly the same delta x end. That will not change. Okay? So this is the little bit of uh, algebra that does that. So we plug in, instead of k, we plug in k plus 2 pi over a. And then uh, by the end of the day, it's the same expression multiplied by this prefactor, which is just 1. Okay? So because this is 1, uh, it's the same delta x. And so uh, basically, the idea is, yes, you can uh, use k or k plus 2 pi over a, no matter the wave the positions of atoms, of actual atoms, will be exactly the same. And so there is uh, some similarity here between the lattice itself. So in the uh, lattice, we had these atoms separated by A, and we could reproduce this lattice uh, by shifting by A, or by 2A, by 3A. Here, we can reproduce the same solution by shifting by 2 pi over a, so something proportional to 1 over a. And so uh, a, uh, a family of points which are connecting k and k plus 2 pi over a are called a reciprocal lattice. So this is the real lattice, and in the k space, we can have a reciprocal lattice. So reciprocal lattice is a very important concept in solid state physics. Um, so uh, you can already see that because we use formulas like this, it is convenient often to work in k space. So k space is called a reciprocal space because in that space the units are uh, 1 over a. So that space is reciprocal with respect to real space with the units are a. And in that space, we can also have a lattice. OK, so all this formalism just comes from analyzing this dispersion relation. Uh, very simple formula. Uh, we can introduce reciprocal lattice uh, in a more formal way uh, by saying that um, all the points equivalent to k equals 0 form this reciprocal lattice. And those points are called g, and they are given by 2 pi times n divided by a. So if we plug in g instead of k, or if we add g or any gn from this family to any k, we are going to have the same solution for uh, the equation of motion. And therefore, all these points are connected in reciprocal space. Um, so there is a reciprocal lattice, which is described by points G n. Here is a correspondence. Uh, in the real space, we have lattice points separated by A. They can, in general, go positive or negative. In reciprocal space, the unit is 2 pi divided by A. So that's in reciprocal space. And the lattice points um, go up as 2 pi divided by a, 2 times 2 pi divided by a, and so on. So all those points in reciprocal space are equivalent, meaning that we can add any of these vectors to any k, and we'll get the same solution. Okay? So there is something called a reciprocal lattice.
So for now, it uh, may look like boring math and introducing terms, but we will see through the course. We use reciprocal space more and more. You will see how useful it is, how uh, nice it is to talk about real experiments like X-ray diffraction in terms of reciprocal space and so on. How easy it is to construct the band structures of materials. So just bear patient with this math for now and you will, uh, it will pay off for you uh, in, in, a, in a few weeks. Okay, so here is a formula that connects uh, vectors in real lattice and reciprocal lattice. So Xn come from positions of atoms along the chain. Those are the Xn's we introduced in the beginning of the lecture. And Gm's are the vectors on the reciprocal lattice. And so the connection between them is described by this. So here I want to mention the word Fourier, right? And you, you can already get a feeling for why I'm saying it, but I'm not going to go further into this for now. Okay. okay, so reciprocal lattice points are also called reciprocal lattice vectors. Right. A more general term. Okay, in terms of definitions, uh, now in terms of, uh, uh, now look at the same picture. And now uh, we know what uh, reciprocal lattice is uh, and what reciprocal space is. Now I can officially call this the first Brillouin Bre zone. So uh, what is the meaning of this zone? This is like a unit cell for real lattice, right? This is the similar thing. So um, we can reproduce the entire case space by repeating this zone. Right? So in this sense, it is similar to uh, a unit uh, cell in real space. So, but there are some differences. So the differences are in definition. So basically, the first zone is defined like I showed you. So it goes from minus 1 to 1 in Ka divided by P. So this first zone is kind of twice the size of the other zones. Um, but not quite true because the second zone is then this one and also this little bit. Okay. They are on two sides. And then this is the third zone. So the first zone is a little special. It, it is all together in one piece. Uh, here, the second zone is fragmented between two sides. So the analogy with the unit cell is not quite full. Uh, it is just an intuitive analogy. So if you want to remember what the brillion zone is, uh, think that it is something like a unit cell in uh, reciprocal space, but uh, the full definition is that this is the first zone, these two bits are the second zone, that's the third zone, and so on. And um, another um, important point about this is that, of course, what happens in the first zone uh, in principle fully describes what's going on in the crystal. So um, for we, uh, we can use other zones for our convenience. We will see how that can be very convenient to go to higher zones. But in principle, all the allowed Ks are already contained in the first zone. So for many, 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 many things, the first zone is just enough. Okay, um, in this slide we reconcile something that uh, may seem also a little strange, uh, that the, the fact that uh, when we increase the wave vector in, 
let's say if we think about photons, right, or waves traveling through space, electromagnetic waves, increase the wave vector, there is a connection to frequency, so we increase the frequency, so there, there, these must be different waves. And if mathematically the solutions here are the same as for those three waves, uh, isn't there a problem here? The fact that uh, we can go from k to k plus 2 pi n over a, we can increase the vector more and more and more, but it, it is still the same vibration of the lattice that is described by this. And uh, the reason why that works is uh, shown in this picture uh, as a phenomenon called the aliasing. Uh, it's a very nice thing, uh, which comes from the fact that uh, we are only looking at vibrations, at the solutions uh, of uh, our equation, at these fixed points, at the red points. We are only looking at those points. We are not looking in between. Uh, that's because we have a fixed number of atoms separated by a distance. So it is not a continuous wave like a photon traveling through space where we care about amplitude at each position in space. We only care about amplitudes at these positions. And for those points, and for those points only, the entire family of waves described by these k plus 2 pi n a for any n, all of these waves will have the exact same instantaneous magnitude at these red points. And this is shown by looking at the blue and the black waves. Blue and the black waves coincide exactly at the red points. And if I plot for you more waves that correspond to different k's, they will still all go through the red points at the exact same positions where they are. So uh, you know, no need to worry about that. It really uh, describes the same wave. All of these k vectors correspond to the same wave, but you only can look at the red points. Don't look in between. So we're just folding some periods of the wave in between, but the phase of the wave is exactly the same. OK. Which brings us also to uh, <coughs> this point, uh, the dispersion relation that I drawn for you, that I just drawn the solution of the equation, uh, k in terms of omega, is a continuous function. Uh, this would imply that any k works as a solution for our chain of atoms. And for e any k in the first Brillouin zone, we can find the corresponding omega. Not quite true, right? because we have in every solid a finite number of atoms. In a real piece of solid, this number can be so huge that this is a really, really good approximation. Uh, but if we, in general, if we consider n atoms per chain, then we will have to uh, satisfy the boundary condition, the fact that the box is finite or the chain is finite. Uh, and we'll have to go through the same math that we already did before, that a wave at position n has to have the same uh, phase as the wave at position small n plus capital N. Um, this is a type of boundary condition where we connect the chain of atoms into a loop. Right? We already did this for the Debye model. And so we, we have to do it again. And we will see that uh, only these values of k are allowed. So instead of having a discrete set of k's, we're going to have, uh, sorry, instead of continuous set of k's, we're going to have only some, some k values will be allowed by this boundary condition. And, but as n goes uh, higher and higher, these points will merge together and form a continuous wave. So for a real solid with Avogadro number of atoms, uh, we won't really be able to tell apart the spacing between these endpoints. So this is a bit of a mathematical thing, but just to connect the dots inside your head, uh, we always have a finite number of modes in a finite size chain. Okay. So the model will give us discrete solutions. All right. 
So um, just by using classical analysis and Newton's equations of motion, we have found the dispersion relation for a one-dimensional chain. It's a sinusoidal dispersion relation. We could find the sound frequency. Uh, we have introduced the reciprocal space, the reciprocal lattice, and Brillouin zone scheme. Uh, those will be all very useful, four very useful concepts to take forward. Uh, and now, actually, a simple part for us, since we already did the Debye and Einstein models last week. Uh, let's quantize this classical one-dimensional chain model. And so, uh, since we are dealing with um, balls on uh, chains, uh, on uh, springs, uh, the way to quantize them is to say that, well, each mode that we found, each omega as a function of k becomes a linear harmonic oscillator. Each mode is its own linear harmonic oscillator. So we went from um, a system of coupled atoms, uh, which would be, I guess, fairly difficult to disentangle and to figure out in terms of what one atom does, the full quantum mechanical picture of it. We went uh, ahead and kind of orthogonalized the motion of these atoms into normal modes. Each mode is like its own uh, object. It corresponds to its own collective vibration of atoms described by frequency omega. And so in that sense, each mode is like its own linear harmonic oscillator uh, oscillating at its own frequency. And so we have transformed this one-dimensional chain into a series of linear harmonic oscillators. And those are decoupled. There is no connection between omega at k1 uh, and omega at k2. Those linear harmonic oscillators are decoupled. Uh, and after that, we know exactly what to do with these objects. For each of these objects, the energy is given by this. Uh, these are the energy levels of each of these harmonic oscillators. And for the rest of it, we know already the full thermodynamics. Um, of these um, harmonic oscillators so we can calculate the heat capacity, uh, the total energy, and so on. OK. Uh, now, um, one excitation in one of these harmonic oscillators, that is what is called a phonon. We already talked about phonons more qualitatively, that this is a, some kind of vibration in a lattice, a quantum of vibration. In a lattice, now I can give you a more precise definition of a phonon. So in one of the modes, one excitation of one of these harmonic oscillators is one phonon. These phonons are bosons, meaning we can put any number of phonons into each of the harmonic oscillators, right? So it's not that each oscillator is one phonon, right? This is important. It's not that each oscillator with each frequency omega is one phonon. No. Each of these can have many phonons living in that mode. Right? So each mode can have many phonons. So each phonon would, that, would then carry this energy. Each phonon will have this energy. Each mode can have several phonons, each having this energy. That's the quantum picture. Now, they are bosons. These vibrations are bosons. Uh, that means that uh, statistically, from the statistical physics point of view, the occupation of each mode for each omega that we found in the omega k solution, in the omega k picture, will be given by the Bose by the Bose factor. 
So each of the harmonic oscillators will have, on average, this number of phonons. And this number will be dependent on the frequency of this mode. So the normal modes of the one-dimensional chain are based some kind of omega k, which is proportional to the sine of ka divided by pi. Each of these modes will have this many phonons on average for temperature given by beta, right? Beta is the temperature. So with temperature, this will also change. And then we already did this when we looked at the Debye model. Uh, we can find the total energy by adding up the Bose factors for each mode. Okay, so this quantum analysis is something we have done already last week. Uh, and what is the difference now? The difference is this dispersion relation. This is the new thing that we've added, essentially, by considering atoms as single objects coupled together by springs, which is something we did not do before. And so... Um, this omega k will now have to use this result from the classical picture. And what was the difference with before? Well, when we considered Einstein's model, those were, uh, he just said, well, in the solid there are some harmonic oscillators. He did not consider any coupling between them. And he just described them all by the same frequency. And so in his case, omega did not have a k-dependent. It was a flat function. It was not a sine function, it was a flat function. In the case of Debye, he just took the result of Planck for photons, for photons, uh, which have a linear dispersion relation. Photons have a linear dispersion relation. And so he just used this formula. And then remember, Debye had a problem that uh, this linear dispersion was going on forever. And so he just introduced a cutoff. He said, above this, there can be no more free, there cannot be a higher frequency than that. We could see that that works out to be just the maximum frequency that we found in our model. So one nice thing that this model does for us, it naturally explains the cutoff that Debye had to introduce ad hoc to the model. He had to say, well, this dispersion relation has to stop somewhere. I don't really have a way to account for it. Well, now we know that it, there is a maximum frequency given by this formula. When the sine is equal to 1, that's the maximum frequency. Okay. So that's an improvement in understanding right there. The rest of the thermodynamics is the same. Uh, we can connect this to the classical law of Dulong Petit at, low temper at high temperature. At low temperature, this can give us uh, the cubic dependence uh, on temperature, just like before. Okay, so sticking with the conceptual uh, view, there is a problem stemming from this infinite repeated uh, dispersion relation. It's a problem of this nature. Okay, um, phonons are particles. Right? Um, the energy of a phonon is given by h omega times n plus one half. That is clear. This phonon is a particle that carries this energy. But a particle should also have momentum. And what would be a natural choice for the momentum of a phonon? Well, the first guess would be k, right? k is like momentum. And uh, in the dispersion relation, we have k. So k uh, could be the momentum of a phonon, except k is not well defined nor it is conserved because k can go on forever and we can have phonons with higher and higher and higher momentum corresponding to the same energy so we define something that is called crystal momentum and this will be the momentum of our phonons so not k but crystal momentum crystal momentum is defined the following way 
whatever k you give me, let's say it's a k out here, find the corresponding k in the first Brillouin zone so that the k is between minus 1 and 1 in these units of ka divided by pi. Find that k and that is going to be the momentum of a phonon. So in a sense this is a k modulo 2 pi would be the crystal momentum. Or we have to find the proper vector gm in the reciprocal lattice. So these are vectors that are only can have values of 2 pi n divided by a. And we, can, we have to find this vector that changes our given k, random k, into the k in the first Brillouin zone. Transposes it back to the first Brillouin zone. And in that case, momentum will be given by h bar k. And that would be the actual momentum that will be conserved. This momentum will be conserved. And this momentum, uh, so for example, you can have a photon coming from outside of the crystal where none of this brilliant zone picture is valid. We have real space. Uh, and exchanging momentum with a phonon living inside the solid. And this will give us the momentum that they exchange. So go back to the first brilliant zone. <coughs> And then I interesting things are uh, possible. For example, the process shown here, um, we have three phonons with momentum 2 thirds pi A each. And this is K. This is uh, not the crystal momentum, but just momentum. And so it is actually perfectly allowed for these three phonons to scatter into three phonons with this momentum. So three phonons that add up to this level here can scatter into three phonons that add up to this level here because this point is the same as this point. Okay. So these kind of funny situations are uh, possible with phonons. Uh, that's because the equivalent of these three phonons their total crystal momentum is zero. So we add up two-thirds pi divided by A times three. We're going to have two pi divided by A. And that transposes from here down to here. Okay. So whichever way we can get back to the total of zero in the first blue end zone is allowed. And so, for example, photons with real momentum this can scatter into photons with real momentum this. Oh, sorry, uh, k momentum this. And the crystalline momentum is zero for the total. Okay. So that's uh, all for introducing phonons themselves. Uh, so phonons are described by energy of a harmonic oscillator and by crystalline momentum, which is a equivalent momentum, but in the first Brillouin zone. Now let's make our chain a little more complex, but it will give us instantaneously more features of real uh, models of solid right here. This is a diatomic chain. That means we have two different atoms. Um, and mathematically, there are two ways to realize such a chain. Solutions are really, really similar. Uh, but uh, one way is to make atoms, a blue atom ha can have a mass of m1. And the red atom can have a different mass, m2. This is most likely what happens in real solids when you have compounds of different atoms, like uh, sodium chloride, for example. Those would be two atoms with a different mass. Um, but actually, for today, we're going to make them equal. And instead, what we're going to vary is spring constants. Turns out that the math is very similar. Uh, it's a little bit simpler when we talk about spring constants. So um, two first atoms are connected by a spring constant kappa 1, and the 
to the next atom with a spring constant kappa 2, and then it repeats itself. So now the unit cell of this chain includes two atoms, which means I have to take this chain of size A, this cell of size A, and repeat it to reproduce the entire crystal. Right? So uh, in between, I have two atoms, one red atom and one blue atom, and this repeats itself indefinitely. So for this uh, model, the unit uh, cell will be defined by the same distance A. However, it will have two different atoms. So we'll start uh, dealing with this. Uh, inside each uh, cell, we're going to have two different sets of coordinates, x and y, for the blue and the red atoms. And so we are going to have not one system of equations, but two, one for delta xn and one for delta yn. So displacements of uh, atoms that are red and atoms that are blue will be described by two different sets of equations. Uh, this, these equations come from the same math, right? So um, it is just mAx is equal to Fx and mAy is equal to Fy. Except masses are the same for x and y but forces are different, um, and forces can have a term that is proportional to kappa 2, connection to, uh, let's say, the, the red ball, and kappa 1, that's a connection to the red ball on the other side. Generally, the approach is very similar. Uh, we are again going to use this wave ansatz, this exponential complex uh, number solution, but we are going to have two sets of those. So one wave for x and one wave for y. As we're looking for solutions that have, uh, we're looking for normal modes, meaning all atoms move together, these two equations will be connected by the same k and the same omega. So we're going to be looking for um, k and omega that solve this entire system of equations. Not one half or one half, but the entire system of equations. This is all quite simple and natural. Uh, well, um, for these uh, system of equations, um, solution uh, comes from uh, diagonalizing this kind of a matrix. So we just write these two equations, uh, plugging in solutions, uh, we write the two equations of motions uh, in a matrix form um, and solving for Ax and Ay and uh, k and omega, we need to diagonalize this matrix and uh, for that we need to take the determinant of the matrix. Um, anyhow, the solution looks like solution in the red box. Uh, quite a bit more complicated expression compared to a monoatomic chain, but nevertheless also has some similarities. Um, so what comes into this equation are all the parameters of the model. Kappa 1 and kappa 2, m, the mass, a, the distance between um, you know, the unit cell atoms, uh, and it connects omega to k. Everything else is constants given by the model, so it connects omega to k, and you can see that therefore we have found a new dispersion relation. We have found a dispersion relation for a diatomic chain. Now, there is a huge difference here. If we are diagonalizing a 2 by 2 matrix, we're going to have two eigenvalues, right, in the, in the diagonal. So, therefore, there is this plus minus term. So, actually, there are two solutions, two omegas for each k. For each k, we are allowed two omegas. And so, this comes just from considering a diatomic chain instead of a monoatomic chain. We get additional branches 
in the dispersion relation. And this is how it looks. These are the two solutions. So the lower one looks kind of familiar, right? It's similar to what we had before. Uh, it is a function that is roughly linear down here, and then it bends towards the edge of what we now know is the Brillouin zone, the first Brillouin zone. It bends. Um, so this is a similar, maybe not mathematically identical to what we had before, but uh, looks a little bit similar. And this is another branch. This is another branch which looks quite different. Right? First of all, it has a maximum at zero momentum, and then it bends down. So the nicknames of these branches are acoustic and optical. This does not have a very deep meaning, but I will motivate for you why that is the case. Okay. Uh, let's just consider some of the uh, limits here. So how do we get a solution at zero? Well, I believe uh, we need to plug in k equal to zero. Well, k equal to zero makes this cosine term be one for k equal to zero. Uh, and then we have k1 plus k2 divided by m. And I guess if we take a minus sign from this, we're going to have minus k1 plus k2 divided by m because this entire expression folds into k1 plus k2 squared, right? So this is k1 plus k2 squared, so this is how we get zero. Uh, what about this point? This must be when we take a plus sign here. And in that case, omega is going to correspond to um, square root of 2 times k1 plus k2 divided by m. Now what about at the boundaries? This is an interesting case. Here at the boundaries, uh, we must put Ka divided by pi equal to 1, which makes this cosine term be minus 1, right? So this is equal to minus 1 for k equal to, uh, well, Ka divided by pi equal to 1. So when this is minus 1, then it falls into k1 minus k2 divided uh, squared. Um, and for the plus sign solution here, uh, we're going to have something that is only proportional to k1. So it's going to have squared root 2 k1 divided by m. And for the minus sign here, we're going to have square root 2k2 divided by m. So this is a plot with numbers on the axis for kappa 2 equal to 2 kappa 1. Um, so we will have to plug in that here. Um, maybe I've mi mixed up kappa 1 and kappa 2 here. Uh, but uh, the fact is that the at these points, it depends only on one or the other. One of the modes will depend just on kappa 1, the other one just on kappa 2. Okay, so the acoustic mode is called so because down here, this looks like sound. Right? This is what we already went through uh, before. Uh, down here, uh, even though it doesn't look like sound everywhere, but down here at k going to 0, this looks like a sound wave, and hence the nickname acoustic. So, by the way, these nicknames are very common. You can find a paper in a journal from this month with, which would talk about optical phonons, acoustic phonons. Uh, so these two things are, uh, they come up in real uh, science, in real uh, research and engineering uh, all the time. Now, with the optical branch, the story is a little more complicated. Uh, so optical comes from light. Uh, and um, uh, the illusion is that these phonons are the ones that have such high frequency that, that they can interact with light. Uh, so the justification is that 
if I put the dispersion relation of light here, it would be a very steep linear dependence. So omega increases very fast with k for light, much faster than for these phonons. Uh, and uh, it, this line, this dispersion relation for phono, photons has no overlap with the acoustic branch, so cannot put energy from a photon into an acoustic phonon. But you can theoretically do that for uh, an optical branch, and that's where the name comes from. In practice, this interaction between light and optical phonons does not happen uh, very easily because there are some spin conservation uh, problems here. But with some mediation, or if you have two photons with a total spin zero, they can go into the optical branch. So uh, this is uh, uh, more nuanced than uh, it seems, but uh, nevertheless, the nicknames come from that. And they are very, very commonly uh, appearing. Okay. Now, uh, this is a picture for a one-dimensional chain. And uh, remember I told you in the beginning that we threw away some of the modes which uh, happen in 3D, in particular the transverse modes. So these are just two longitudinal modes for a 1D chain. But in a three-dimensional material, there will be more modes here. However, with this very simple extension of a one-dimensional chain to two atoms, I could show you that multiple branches are possible. Next time you see several branches on a dispersion relation plot, you will not be surprised or will not be as surprised. Right? So this is the benefit of uh, doing this. OK. Now, one more mind trick or math trick with these zones. Um, remember, k axis is periodic, right? It keeps going. So uh, let's take the optical mode, for example, and just keep plotting it. So it will start bending back and repeating itself, right? Uh, so let's now erase it here and only plot it in the first, second brilliant zone. So acoustic mode only in the first zone, optical mode in the second. This is the picture on the right that we are going to get in this case. Now, this is called an extended zone representation of the phononic spectrum. Uh, and um, we're going to see why that is useful in a moment. Uh, but it looks like we have sort of a broken, broken line here, uh, but a single line. So uh, here at zero momentum, we start with a linear dispersion relation, but then that bends. Then there is a discontinuity at the first brilliant zone boundary. And then the bend picks up with a shift and continues again, so on. Uh, so sometimes it's convenient to plot the zones this way. Um, and this is really equivalent, right? What all I did is I shifted all these uh, points by a reciprocal uh, lattice vector by G, which moved them all from the first brilliant zone to the second. That's all I did. And that is allowed. They describe the same waves, the same modes. Now, one immediate thing that it can help us with is uh, to uh, go continuously from uh, diatomic chain to monatomic chain. So here is a situation where two atoms are quite different. Two spring constants are very different. And we have this picture with a large gap here. Now, watch closely as I make these two guys more and more similar. So here, them coming closer together, you can see that the the gap here is closing, uh, went too fast. Here they're almost the same, and the gap is even smaller. Here they are identical, and the gap has closed. So remember, this here is what was called optical. And this here 
is what was called acoustic in the diatomic chain model, except now these are all the same, masses are all the same, and we went back to the monoatomic limit, and we have recovered the same picture as we had before. Here is a difference between the two pictures. The difference is in the scale here. Uh, here, the scale is stretched by a factor of two compared to this. And this also comes from a very simple fact that in the beginning of the lecture, we have defined the unit cell as a distance between atoms. And here, it is roughly twice the distance between atoms. And therefore, this axis got stretched. Uh, so we, we can reconcile the two pictures by saying that uh, this uh, A1 here is larger than A there. Okay. And so we went from diatomic solution to monoatomic solution, uh, but it teaches us a very important lesson about what is a unit cell, right? The unit cell is something we have to use to describe periodically the lattice. So we can choose two different kinds of unit cell. If k kappa 2 is equal to kappa 1, uh, we can describe this crystal with a double the size. We will get the same solution, but it will be stretched. Um, so the smallest unit cell is what we're often going to use uh, going forward. This is what happens uh, when the unit cell is not chosen to be the smallest one. OK, I uh, think this is uh, the end of today's lecture. You guys have any?